If we're going to have a child, it's something that should happen in the next five years. You know, I think that we're as poised to do it now as we ever have been, but I don't know that it's actually going to happen because she's into it, but she would do it to make me happy. And though I want children, I don't require it for happiness. Roxanne Gay is almost too many good things to list, but some highlights include best-selling author, brilliant professor, dynamic podcast host, and columnist for the New York Times. She also happens to be my mentor turned dear friend and one of the most consistent sources of love and encouragement in my life. She's like my writer mom. The first time we met, I actually thought, she's very energetic (laughs) because I'm old. We met in 2010. I was a student at Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana, and I was looking for any indication that a future in the creative arts, writing specifically, was possible. My fiction professor, Sean Lovelace, suggested I read more of the writing available online. He pointed me towards the work of Roxane Gay, and I fell in love. Then I shared that love with all my creative writing classmates until we all fell in love. Professor Lovelace coordinated a kind of field trip that allowed a group of us to meet Roxanne before one of her readings, and I was very excited. You are so enthusiastic, and you just seem to want to, like, swallow the whole world. I had no idea that crowded little dinner would lead to a real friendship with a writer who I really admired and who, to my surprise, liked me back. Every time we see each other, it's just like, that's right. We're just like peas and rice. (laughs) (laughs) I adore Roxanne so much, I ended up introducing her to her now wife, the extraordinarily talented designer, Debbie Millman. Debbie is someone I met later in life, and in many ways it was unexpected. You know, she's a foil. She is my best friend. She is sexy. Roxanne is 48 and Debbie is 61. And after four years together, they have a big decision to make. Do they want to have children? I'm Ashley C. Ford, and this is Going Through It, a show about important moments in people's lives and how they navigate them. This season, we're asking how people decide whether or not to become parents. It's a question that's been on my mind a lot. My husband Kelly and I have been married for four years, and we've finally gotten to a place where having kids doesn't sound like a bad idea. But we're still not sure that makes it a good idea. So I'm talking to some brilliant people about how they made that choice, what considerations and obstacles they faced, and how it's impacted their life. In this episode, we're talking with Roxanne Gay who, like me, is still figuring out if parenting is part of the life she wants. So how did the conversation about whether or not to have children together start? Like, when did you guys start talking about that? I would say early on in our relationship, because... When you're older, it's not that there's an urgency, but there's less need to waste time. It's not like you're 23 and you don't have to think about it and you have like 25 years of fertility ahead of you. Not only fertility, but energy to chase after a little human. Quite frankly, that's the more important concern. And so I think for both of us, and for me in particular, it was a question of, we should probably, if we're going to have a child, it's something that should happen in the next five years. You know, I I don't think it's something where we ever sat down with like a spreadsheet and we're like, who's going to, you know, it was more just should we? And I'm like, yes, we are going to be great parents. And Debbie has always been, she would be an amazing parent, but she worries about her age. She doesn't think it's fair to a child because she's um, 13 years older than I am. And I'm like, men do it all the time. All the time. You're fine, like truly. And so the conversations have been ongoing, but it's not like an everyday or even an every week conversation. 
we've been spending a lot of time with my 10-year-old niece, Parker, who's amazing. And last time after we saw Parker, we had to spend 10 days in quarantine in a hotel room in Paris with her. It was the two of us and her. And we were like, I don't know how we're going to do this. This struggle (laughs) is fucking real. It turned out that it was a delight. And so after, Debbie was really like, you know what? We can do this. You know, I think that we're as poised to do it now as we ever have been. But I don't know that it's actually going to happen because she's into it, but she would do it to make me happy. And though I want children, I don't require it for happiness. Right. And I I don't want to strong arm her. Like, it's something that you both have to want, I think, wholeheartedly. And I hear her reservations, even though I know it's a non-issue, they're an issue for her. And so I have to respect that. Tell me more about the children who are already in your life. Well, we have nieces and nephews on both sides of the family. And when my brother died, my nephew, who's 26, but differently abled, I'll say, he's basically our child now. So we got a 26-year-old son and he's tall. (laughs) We have lots of youthful energy in our lives and... It's wonderful to be able to be the cool aunt, whether it's biological or otherwise, and recognize that there are all kinds of ways to parent, even if it's not in the most traditional way. It's so interesting to me that some of your main considerations in the decision, however it goes, are age and energy because neither of you ever stop moving. You're <laughs> you're always doing something. Like I mean, I know many people who are parents who don't move <laughs> as mm-hmm. much as you guys do. And to be perfectly honest, kind of specifically Debbie, who really does not stop moving. No, she never sits down. It's like you need to go somewhere right. and have a seat. <laughs> and she's like, no, I'm going to go run this marathon real quick. Right. <laughs> and that's why ultimately I'm not concerned about age and energy. And it's not that I'm delusional about how difficult parenting is because I have seen my brothers and their children. Like Parker is a full-time job. That child starts talking for the minute she opens her eyes and then will like even talk in her sleep. Oh my God. Oh my God. When we were in Paris, <laughs> I was just like, are you being paid by the word? <laughs> like, what? Like, who is doing this? Like, why are you speaking to me? And it's always a question. <laughs> what is this? What is that? And they're like, not just sort of like, why is the sky blue? But instead, why do we have an aorta? And so I was just walking around with Wikipedia open for the whole week. <laughs> and finally, I was like, I got you. Go ahead. What's next? Don't think I won't. I will. I think the biggest real issue is that we travel too much Mm -hmm. and we are currently bi-coastal and will be for at least another two years. So our lifestyle would have to change. And I think right now, I don't know that either of us is that inclined to change our lifestyle in the ways that we would have to change them to create space for a child. You know, in some ways, choices answer the ultimate question of whether or not you're going to have a family. Like, until you change your choices, you know, you know what that answer is. Oh, my gosh. I know. It's so interesting that you say that. Just because I am at this place where I'm asking myself this question, and I am the one who kept bringing up, like, are we going to do this? Do we want to do this? And for a while, Kelly was the one who was a lot more hesitant. And then he was very much like, yeah, we should do it. And I want to do it. And as soon as he said, yeah, let's do it, then I was the one who was wavering because the ball was in my court. <laughs> I did the same thing. Is this <laughs> it? Why did we do that? One day, Debbie came downstairs and she said, let's do it. We have someone who's going to give us an egg. And she was like, let's just go. Let's get her to sign up for the appointment to start the harvesting and so on. And I was like, hmm, well, let's see. <laughs> I did the same thing. As soon as the ball was in my court, I definitely suddenly felt the weight of the decision and started to realize things that I had never realized before. Like the Mm -hmm. fact that me deciding whether or not to have a kid is the first time 
as far as I know, any woman in my family, in my bloodline, has ever decided to get pregnant. Like, Mm -hmm. didn't just Mm -hmm. get pregnant or, you know, just have it be the expectation. Like, nobody ever was really at a point in their life where they were like, oh, I could try to become a parent. Or... I could just keep doing what I'm doing, which is really good and really nice. And neither of those decisions at this point feels greater or better to me. That's interesting. I understand the sort of like, not ambivalence per se, but the hesitation where you're like, wait, wait, do you really want us to do this? Like for real, for real? Yeah. It's a huge decision. But It's interesting what you say about none of the women in your family having chosen to have a child. I think many of us have similar situations with our families. And so when you get to make that choice, it is very different. But one of the things I do know is that if and when you make that decision, it's going to be challenging, but it's also going to be okay because of the person that you have by your side. Whatever doubts I have, like, am I going to be overly critical in the way that perhaps... My mother, who I love, is, you know, (laughs) am I going to bring that baggage forward? Am I going to be too intense about performance and grades? I always think I have this perfect counterbalance here who's going to help me overcome the more complex parts of myself to sort of do everything we both can do to preserve this like little human and their emotional safety. And so I always come back to that when I'm feeling particularly anxious. Like, whatever I'm scared of, I do actually have a safety net. Yes. And I feel so often the same way. A lot of the things that I'm scared of, I'm like, kids talk all the time. Mm -hmm. Like, that'll drive me crazy. Like, what what am I going to do? And I was like, wait a minute. Kelly talks all the time. (laughs) He'll talk to him. Mm -hmm. (laughs) He'll be the one who talks to him all the time. We'll be right back. Looking at you and Debbie sometimes is sort of like looking at an alternate reality for me where I'd married a woman. (laughs) Um, And it makes me wonder how queerness comes into your conversations and impacts your decision around kids or no kids? I think for both of us, even though I came out at 19 and Debbie came out at 50. So in her previous relationships, she certainly thought about having children, but it always was a possibility for her. For me, I came out at a time that was very different from this time, at a time where Having a family was simply not a possibility. Marriage was not a possibility. And at the time, we genuinely believed it was not going to happen in our lifetimes. To see how much that has changed in this lifetime is incredible. And so as times have changed, the feasibility of it has changed. And when I find myself thinking about it and wondering, like, what am I actually going to do? I am always struck by wow, no matter what, this is a possibility. And it's a possibility that no one can take from me by virtue of where we live, which is New York and California. And that's just incredibly gratifying. You know, the thing Kelly always says to me when I bring it up again or when I'm like, I'm I'm thinking about it, I I don't know yet, what are we going to do? He always looks at me and he just says, you know, Whatever family we have, if it's me, you, and a dog, if it's me and you, if it's me, you, and a child, me and you and our community and their children who come in and out of our home and in and out of our lives, whatever family we have is the family I want. That's so sexy. Oh, my God. I know. Most poets stay away from them, but every once in a while. Just run. (laughs) Just run. It's you in danger, girl. <laughs> you in danger, girl. That's what I tell people usually. But every once in a while, the universe comes together. And you have this opportunity to have that kind of connection with somebody and to talk about building a family this way where you feel safe and held. And you always thought that like, oh, if I felt safe and held, this is the decision I think I would just automatically make. But mm-hmm. now you're safe and held 
And your body, your mind is still like, I I don't know. (laughs) Like, what do you want? Do you feel like it's more your decision or like it's still something that you're trying to come to a conclusion on together? It's a great question. And I would say sort of both, but really it's my decision. Because I know that she'll do whatever I want in this regard. Right. She wants me to be happy. And if this is something that will make me happy, she will do it. But I'm mindful of the clock and I'm 48. And I know that if we don't do it in the next two years, it's not going to happen. Because there does get a point where you think, okay, now it's not that we're too old, but we're too old. Because you want to be there for the child. You don't want to just leave them high and dry at like 22 or something like that. And, you know, I think ultimately we're going to parent whatever that may be in different ways. We have a puppy who's great. And I just always think, wow, we have made a little family, the two of us. And it's great. And if we expand that family, it will be great. And if we don't, it will still be great. There's so many different ways of mothering and showing up for people in whatever way you can. I know that because I've had a lot of different people do the work of mothering me over the course of my life. And I feel really lucky that I realized that that's what I needed. Other cases, I needed something different. You know, sometimes I needed more mentoring than mothering. And that's how our relationship started. Yes. And that's not unique to me. There are so many people who I have met and had conversations with and our connection comes from the fact of like, oh, Roxanne helped you do. Oh, Roxanne published you too. (laughs) Roxanne edited you too. What does mentoring look like on the other side? What is it like for you? You know, it's something I definitely fell into. It's not something I ever anticipated doing. I don't know that I have like a particularly maternal gene, (laughs) but then I kind of do. And mentoring isn't always maternal. It is whatever the situation calls for. But as I've gotten older, as I've gotten deeper into my career, I have certainly understood that sometimes it helps if you have someone who is walking by your side and is there to provide support, whatever that support might look like. And so I just try to make myself as useful as possible to the people I believe can make the most use of my usefulness. Mm. little word salad there, but I think it makes sense. So that's what I try to focus on. A lot of times I do something that I feel is fairly small and that others have interpreted as significant. And I just think, imagine what would happen if we all did things that we thought were really small, but that could still be incredibly powerful for someone else? It's not always material things. Sometimes it's just a listening ear. Sometimes Mm -hmm. it's time. Sometimes it's, hey, come on stage with me at this Mm -hmm. event. A blurb. I'm well, a hug. (laughs) (laughs) You can't even get it out. I know. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's a, it, it can be whatever. And I am fortunate in that, I mean, I've certainly been broke many times in my life and the early years as a faculty member were challenging, but I don't have children. It's so important to remember that. Like when you don't have children, you have resources that you can deploy for these very reasons. And if there's something I can do to support someone And I can identify it and offer it. Let's not even like wait for you to ask. I know what you ultimately need. Let me give it to you. That way you don't have to agonize over how do I ask? What do I do? This is uncomfortable. Like you can feel all that and live your truth, but we can also cut to the chase. Despite not thinking of yourself as particularly maternal, You have this uncanny ability to say things that sort of fill in the gaps for people who are what I would call severely unmothered. I'm one of them. I don't get a lot from my mother, never have, never will. And you've provided a lot of things for me that I feel like I should have gotten from a parent. Do you think that mentoring gives you an element of motherhood that you wouldn't get otherwise? 
I would normally say yes, except that I teach. And because I teach, I also get some of that sense of, if not mothering, shepherding. Shepherding. Mm -hmm. I like that. But mentoring absolutely does give me some of that energy. And I do think it's one of the reasons that I enjoy it. Because when you see your mentees moving into the best versions of themselves, and even when they fail, you're like, well, at least you were in a position to fail. Right. Good job. (laughs) (laughs) You know, it is satisfying and it does feel very if not maternal, parental, Mm. like you just think this person is in my care. It may not be a traditional sense of care, but they are in my care. And that means something. And I take that responsibility seriously because of that. And that's the thing, like the rewards of working with other people, of supporting other writers in particular, oh, the rewards are so great. Like when you came out with somebody's daughter, after years of talking about this book and working on it, I was just like, look at that. Look at that. Look at my baby go. (laughs) I mean, those moments, that's it. Like, that's the payoff. And it's just amazing. Do you think my work would suffer by becoming a parent? Oh, God, no. It's only going to make your writing richer. It's going to bring more depth and nuance, which is saying something because you already have that in your work. I think that we're not going to hear from you for about two years (laughs) in terms of writing. I think just keeping it real. I think that you're going to take a little step back and that's okay. But when you come back, you were going to have even more to say. So no, I don't think your writing is going to suffer. I think people are just going to have to be patient. And that's okay. Mm. Okay, so my last question was going to be, what do you think I should do? But I think I know. I think I... <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think you should do whatever your spirit tells you. But I personally, having known you for many years and knowing your husband, I think you should absolutely have at least one child. Despite not being well mothered by your biological mother, you have found ways to mother yourself. And watching you mother yourself, especially the past four years, ah, oh, you're going to be a phenomenal mother. Yeah. Uh, the two of you are going to raise a strange little poet who <laughs> loves to walk along the moors in England. <laughs> I just think whatever kind of child you bring into the world, they're going to be fucking lucky. So if you go that route, and I hope you do, you're going to be great. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. And I just want to squeeze it. I'm like, just (laughs) name the baby after me. That's all. I'm just kidding. Oh, my God. (laughs) I have to say, whether or not I have kids It will always feel amazing to hear a vote of confidence in my ability to nurture a growing person. I don't think I'm alone in that. Whether or not we choose parenthood, I like to think everyone wants to be good to the children they know and to see that care reflected in how those kids turn out. There are so many ways to show up for young people as a mentor, as a friend, as a person who can slip them some extra cash when their parents aren't looking. I know this personally because of all the people, Roxanne included, who showed up and filled in those gaps for me. People I'll be grateful for for the rest of my life. Going Through It is a production of Pineapple Street Studios and MailChimp. Our producer is Emerald O'Brien. Our associate producers are Marina Henke and Yinka Rickford Anguin. Our managing producer is Camila Kashani. The show is edited by Aaron Edwards. Mixing by Davy Sumner. Original music by Mike Noyce and Davy Sumner with additional music from Epidemic Sound. Mara Davis is our booker. We had help from Stephen Key, Jason Richards, and Ari Saperstein. 
Legal Services for Pineapple Street by Bianca Grimshaw at Granderson de Roche. Our executive producer is J.N. Barry. Our production partners at MailChimp Studios are Julie Douglas, Sasha Brown, Christina Humphrey, and Caroline Albro. And a special thanks to my better half, without whom none of this would be possible. My assistant, Ariane Young. And thank you for listening. We know the range of experiences around this decision is so broad. And while we can't cover every story, we're grateful that we could bring you a few of them. 